37 from verses 1, the Bible says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in an open valley and Lord, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones. And say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and you shall, and I will bring up flesh upon you. And cover you with skin and put breath in you and he shall live and he shall know that I am the Lord. Now get this. I want you to get verse 7. It's very much important. He says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and behold a shaking. And the bones came together, born to his bone. And when I beheld, Lord, the sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them above. But there was no breath in them. Verses 9. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Now he's no longer prophesying to the bones. He's now prophesying to the wind. Get this. He said, prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. Verses 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. A brief way of ministering on what I've captioned, what to do when you don't know what to do. Let me start my message by explaining to us that the greatest tragedy on earth, the greatest terror on earth, the greatest pain on earth, it is not necessarily failure as they think, but to be at a place of not knowing what to do. Nothing is as painful in life as being stranded. A lot of people as I'm speaking right now, they are at a place where they are stranded and stuck. They want to do something, but they don't know what is it that they are going to do. They want to do something, but they don't know what they can do. And listen, the worst thing you can do about a situation is nothing. If you're in a situation and you successively do nothing about it, then you have done your worst. Most of the times I've observed that life brings people at a place sometimes where they are stranded and stuck, where they do anything that there is to do and nothing is happening. They, they, they are left at a place where they don't know what to do next. I've seen people that would tell you that they are tired of their situation. They are tired of going through what they are going through. They want to come out but they don't know what to do in order to come out. I have met people that will tell you to say they are tired of being single. They have been single for a long time. They want to say to Maritali, they want to get married. But they don't know what to do in order for them to get married. 
I have met people that will tell me that they are tired of being jobless. They are tired of living hand to mouth. They are tired of borrowing and begging. So they want to get married, but they don't know what to do to get married. They don't know what to do to get a job. They don't know what to do in order for them to get a business. There are many people, even as I'm speaking right now, who are tired of begging and borrowing. They need a job. They need a business. But they don't know what they can do in order to get that business. There are people that have been to places. They have gone anywhere. They have gone everywhere looking for a child. They have been married for a long time. And they are believing God for a child. They are unable to get a child. Their wife is unable to conceive. And yet they have done everything. And they need a child. They don't have a child. So they don't even know what they can do next in order for them to get a child. I have met people that have done everything in their power to be able to pass their exams. They keep on failing and repeating. They keep on failing and repeating. Now they are tired. They want to do something, but there's nothing left to do according to them. There's nothing that can be done. So they are a place where they don't know what to do in order to come out of their challenge. There are many people, even as I'm speaking right now, who are in terrible situations, who are in serious situations, difficult situations. They want to come out, but they don't know what to do in order to come out. And some of us, that's the reason why we're even here today. How many of us have ever been at a place in life where you don't know what to do next. Where you want to give up because you don't know the next step to take. You don't even know if there's and even a thing called the next step. You don't even know what you're going to do next. And you don't even know if there's a next thing to do at all. How many of us, as I'm speaking today, life has put you at a place where everything that was in your mind that people told you to do, you have done everything and it seems like nothing worked out. How many of us are at a place where you want to give up on life? You want to give up on everything. You want to give up on marriage. You want to give up on your job. You want to give up on your business because you have done everything and nothing seems to work out. How many of us people are laughing at us as I'm speaking right now because it appears like we are stranded in life. It appears like we, are, we don't even have an option at all. It appears like we are stuck because we don't know what we can do in order to better our lives, in order to do something about our family, in order to do something to change our career, to change our marriage, to change our situation. It appears there's nothing. So we are stranded and we are stuck. <sighs> have you ever been to the maybe escorted somebody or maybe taken somebody or have you ever heard of a person that has been sick and you take them to the hospital and the doctors diagnose them they do everything that they can and at the end of the day they tell you there is nothing we can do the person is sick and doctors say there is nothing we can do the person is complaining they are in pain you can see by their countenance that this person is in pain and doctors will tell you that we have done everything and as it stands there is nothing else that we can do I don't know if we have people that have been in that situation before where you know you feel it that you want to come out of this situation and yet you don't know how to come out where you can feel it that what I'm going through is is, is not a good situation. I want to come out, but you don't know how. Where you can look at a situation, you want to do something, but you don't even know what you can do. Because when you analyze it very well, there is nothing to do that has remained. So you don't know what you can do about it. How many have been at that place where you are stuck and you are stranded? You've cracked your head, you've thought, overthought, but there's nothing that you are coming up with. There's no solution as it were. That situation, that place in life where there's nothing left to do. 
where you don't know what to do. But I want to submit to us today that there is always something to do even when you don't know what to do. There is something you can do when you are at a place where you don't know what to do. And when you do the needful, there is always a solution. There is always positive outcome. I want to encourage somebody that there is something that you can do when you are at a place where you don't know what to do. And when you do the needful, God certainly takes people out of their situation. So there is what to do when you don't know what to do. Hallelujah. Israel, that represents the church of the Old Testament, was once at this place in life. So we are at a place where they didn't know what to do next. Because the Bible gives Ezekiel a parable. And whenever you see all these bones that Ezekiel is seeing, all these bones that he sees, is God is not trying to talk about bones. Yes, he carried him in the spirit for you. Yes, he took him in the spirit. He placed him at a, an area where there was a valley. And in that valley, it was full of dry bones. This is a valley which has a lot of bones. Then the spirit of the Lord carries the man of God, Ezekiel. And he begins to make him pass by the bones. As it were, to see the bones. And to analyze them critically. So Ezekiel walk passes through the bones. And the Bible says he gives a testimony. He says there were very many in an open valley. And Lord, they were very dry. So these are dry bones. Then the Lord comes to Ezekiel and asks him. He said, son of man, can these bones live? In short, what can you do to make these bones live? And Ezekiel answered as a major prophet. He says, oh Lord God, thou knowest. In other words, I don't know what I can do to make these bones live. I don't know if there's anything that I can do. So you are the only one that knows. As for me, I know nothing. Then God told him, there is what you can do and I'll tell you. There is something you can do and I'll tell you. Hallelujah. Please follow me. So, Ezekiel, he's taken at a place where the bones are dry. But when you read the story very well, you, you realize that God is not interested in the bones. He is not interested in the dryness of the bones and the valley and all, all this display that is happening. That's not what God is interested in. He is interested in one thing. And that is what we are told in verses 11. On verses 11, God says, these bones you are seeing, it is a typology of the children of Israel. This is a typology of the children of Israel. Because the children of Israel are like bones. They are complaining that our bones are dried. We have lost hope. We are giving up because our situations are hard. So the bones that you are seeing here, these are the children of Israel complaining about their situations. Their situation is hopeless. Hear what he says in verse 11. He says, Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried. Our hope is lost. And we are cut off of our parts. So the bones that we see there, it is God trying to portray a message that depicts the situation of the Israelites. So the Israelites were at a place of hopelessness. They are saying our bones are dried. We have lost our hopes and we have been cut off. Three things there. Dryness, loss of hope, and being isolated, being cut off. How many of us we have been believing God for something and it has taken long. That thing is not happening and our hope has been lost. It's indeed in Proverbs which says, hope delayeth maketh the heart sick. How many of us, our hopes have been lost as it were and as it looks. From the look of things, we don't have anything left that we can cling on that will guarantee us to make it in life. Our hopes are lost. There is something that makes a man continue living even if everything is lost and that is hope. 
If there is one thing that makes a man continue living, even if everything else is lost, and that is hope. You can lose your car, but as long as you still have your hope, you might get another one. You might lose your marriage. As long as you've got hope, you'll get married again. You might lose your business or a relationship, but as long as you have got hope, you'll get another one. But then when you get to a place that even your hope is lost, Do you know the reason why people commit suicide? People don't commit suicide because they have lost their car or their house. No. They commit suicide because they have lost their hope. They hope to get another one. If you have lost your car and you still have hope that maybe next year you get another one, you don't have any reason to die. But if you have lost your car and your hope is gone that you are never going to get it, that's how people now end up committing suicide. I would, I would encourage everyone that is here that it doesn't matter what else you can lose on earth. Never lose your hope. Never lose your hope. You can lose your business. It's okay. It happens sometimes. Business is always ups and downs. There are losses at times. But listen, never lose your hope. Whatever thing that you can lose, always have a hope that you get it again. But as I'm speaking, there are some of our brothers and sisters in this place they are, be, they are at a place right now where even their hope has gone. There's nothing we're living for right now. There's nothing we're living for. Because they have lost their little hope. The little hope that they had is all gone. So there's nothing anymore that they are living for. Their hope is gone. Now listen to this. That is the first thing that Israelites lost. Hope. And the Bible says, and they complain, they say, and we are cut off. We are cut off. We have been relegated. We've been, we, we have been rejected as it were. You see, sometimes you might not realize how bad things are in your life until certain people begin to cut you off. You might not realize, you might not feel the pain of a degradation if you are in a higher position until certain people begins to cut you off. When things are okay and well in your life, there are certain people that come around you. There are certain people that you mingle with, that you meet and greet, that you rub shoulders with. But when you are demoted, when you go down in life, there are certain people because of your status, they can't mingle with you anymore. There are places you cannot be found anymore. And that's what brings the pain and the realization of how lowly you've become. What you used to do, you cannot do anymore. Whom you used to, in, to mingle with, you cannot mingle with them anyway, um, anymore. Because it is like, as if your level has been reduced. Where sometimes they're organizing family meetings and you're not in, in, included. You're not involved. They don't involve you. Because they know that even if they involve you, that's a burden. You're another Lord. People begins to cut you off. They begin to cut you off. He says, and our bones are dried. Dryness speaks of a situation that is hopeless. It speaks of a situation where things are not okay. It speaks of difficulties. When, he, when a person is doing business and he says, ah, this is dry. They are talking about a situation where no sales. There are no sales, no customers, nothing is moving. It is a place of stagnation. And there were many bonds. In other words, there are many people that are in this situation. And the, the, the Lord God of Israel, he came to the prophet and he tells him what to do. He says, since you are a place that even you as a prophet, you don't know what to do. The people in the situation that even them, they don't know what to do. There is one thing that I'm going to tell you to do it. Then when you do this, this is like a last card. This is like a divine joker. When you do this, when you do this, believe you me, there will be hope. When you do this, trust me, there will be revival. He says when you do this, something big is going to happen. And guess what he told him? He says prophesy. We thought he was going to tell him to do something sophisticated. And the only thing he tells him is to prophesy. He says, so you are a place that you don't know what to do. He says, prophesy to these bones. These 
are inanimate objects. These are not human beings. They are bones. And you and I, we believe that bones don't have ears. But he says prophesy to them. If you can only but prophesy, they will hear. They are bones. To you, the, the, the bones rather have got ears. To you, they appear like they don't have. They have. I know where their ears are. If you can prophesy, they will hear. So what to do when you don't know what to do, when life puts you at a place of not knowing what to do, it is to engage the last gear of God, and that is to prophesy. There are times, ladies and gentlemen, that you have prayed the manner of prayers and it seems like heaven is not answering. There are times that you have approached everyone, anyone that you know, and it seems like they can't help you when you are at that place. Stop looking for help from man. Some trust in horses. Some trust in, in chariots. He says, but we remember the name of the Lord. That is the time to look at God, look at the Bible, and look at your life. Take what is in the Bible, put it this side. Look at God and where he is. Use the authority of God. Take from what is in the Bible. Look at your life and prophesy into your life. If only but you can prophesy. Situations have got ears. Singleness has got ears. See, in the realms of the spirit, even situations are objects. Words are objects. Singleness is a name. It has got a spirit. It has got a spirit backing it. And that spirit has got ears and it hears. Divorce is a situation. Behind the situation, there's a spirit backing it. And that spirit has got ears and it hears. Hunger has ears. Failure has ears. Poverty has got ears. Joblessness has got ears. Your life has got ears. Your situation has got ears. If you can only but prophesy to it, it will hear and obey. So the last card of God for people that are stuck in life is prophecy. Nothing else, it is prophecy. That is the joker of God. A whole lot of a prophet doesn't know what to do. <laughs> we thought God was going to tell him to do some crazy stuff and complicated things. He only told him said to prophesy, that's all. He says when you prophesy, everything will change. And he started doing it small, small. When he prophesies, he thought, he said, what am I going to do next? He thought God would tell him something and say, prophesy again. You prophesy, he said, prophesy again. He prophesied. And until the Bible tells us, say, when he prophesied in verse 10, he says, so I prophesied as he commanded me. He says, and after prophesying, I saw the bones that were just relegated bones. He says, they stood up on their feet, an exceeding great army. <laughs> so it appears like they were bones. Yet those were human beings in hopeless situations. But when he prophesied, they came back together. If only but you can look at your life with the eyes of God. With the eyes of the scriptures. And speak what you want to see in your life. And speak authoritatively what you want to become of your life. Your life is never going to continue like that. I said your life is never going to continue like that. The problem is that you are looking at your life going bad and you are just watching. Things are going bad and you are just watching. How many of us have actually entered into problems without doing anything at all? Listen, the Bible says I've given you a mouth and a wisdom with which no man shall be able to resist or gainsay. So God has given you a mouth and the word mouth is a Greek word stomach that speaks of a sword. So your mouth carries the power that is comparable to that of a sword. It is able to pierce. It is able to divide. It is able to separate. It is able to cut barriers. It is able to cut bondages and break in pieces anything standing ahead of you. So if you can only but use your mouth very well and speak what you want to see in your life and speak what you want to see. Declare how you want things to go. You'll be out of that situation. I said you'll be out of that situation. Listen, you are the greatest prophet of your life. You are the greatest, the first prophet of your life. You see, the problem that we are having today where some, everyone is complaining, say, that one is not a good prophet, that one is a fake prophet. This and Somebody can prophesy you a lie, but you can't prophesy yourself a lie. If you can only but trust yourself as your prophet and begin to use 
because the power that God has enshrined in you, your life can't be like that. Imagine the whole of the prophet. He's at the valley of dry bones. And what is he doing? He begins to prophesy. Now imagine this is a man standing. He said, bones, I'm speaking to you. God is saying, he's talking to bones. No, form a mental picture. The problem is that when you're reading the Bible, you just read and leave it like that. But create a picture. You are going in the, in the bush and you find a man. For example, it's your husband. You find him. He's addressing a heap of bones. And he's having a conversation with bones. Serious conversation. Say, you bones, the way you are right now, huh? very soon you are going to leave. He's talking to bones. Look at how crazy it is. And this is your husband. Very soon you might down 911. You can even try to take him to an hour. Because you don't understand what has gone wrong in his head. But that's how they are things of the spirit. People might not understand. Sometimes go to your car. Hold your car. Lay hands on your car. Get your phone. Touch your phone. Bless your phone. Prophesy. Every time you can't be receiving just because uh, somebody has died. Someone is sick. Someone has been involved in an accident. We need to sit down. Just crazy calls that you're receiving. Hold your phone. He said, you phone. I'm speaking to you. Hear my voice. It doesn't matter what is happening to you. But from today, you start receiving good calls. Speak to your phone. This is how we are as Christians. We are not of this world. We are in this world, of course, but we are not of this world. So our operations, people can't understand them. The problem is that you are trying all by all means to be normal, to fit in and to suit the standards of the world. Become crazy. Become crazy. Understand and look at your life. Speak to your life. Sometimes you have a child who keeps on failing every time. When they fail, at times, yeah, it's good to be, you know, upset and angry and beat them all and all those kind of things. But at times, just get them, sit them and say, sit down, you. Start speaking in their life. Said you'll be a great child, you. You will make it. You'll never fail anymore. From today, I bless you. Your brain will function. Start speaking over your children. I understand the discipline that parents put in place. But I've realized that a lot of us, we don't do much apart from leaving the whole responsibility to teachers and tutors. But we have got a part to play. Sit down your child and prophesy them. Bless them. Speak over their lives. And what you say will come to pass. Look at your results. That you, you papers that have not been getting jobs. What, are, what, is the, what is the problem with you? The same papers that I have, others have gotten jobs, but you are not productive. Today I prophesy you. Prophesy your papers. Prophesy your certificates, your diplomas, your credentials, your CV. Prophesy it. Prophesy. Let words come from your heart. And when you prophesy them, they should hear what you are saying. The Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verses 4, it says where the word of the king is, there is power. Where the word of the king is, there is power. It says who can say, why doest thou this? Imagine where the word of the king is, it says there is power. And in Revelation chapter 1 from verse 6, it says God has made us kings and priests. So we are kings and priests and the Bible says where the word of the king is, there is power. So where our words are, there is power. So your words have got power if you can only but authoritatively decree them. You can't continue every time and they, you are, you're complaining about your husband every time. Sometimes as he goes for work, get this picture, put it aside, start speaking to it. Start prophesying over that picture. He's out there, said you will not misbehave anymore. You will be a very good man. You will work according to my standards of a good man. I prophesy you right now. Uh, make dangerous decrees over your husband. I'm telling you, this every time it seems that he's, he's working overtime, even under COVID, he's working overtime. So I know no, there's an assignment I'm doing at work. I'm coming 22 hours, 23 hours. Take his picture, look at him, say from today. You'll be a good man. I prophesy you are no longer going to be broke. These brokes that you're experiencing. Because you can't have a man every time he's broke and you don't do anything about it. So you're not going to be stranded. You're not going to be broke. I prophesy over your life. Look at him. Look at the pictures. If, how do you think we are praying over your pictures? Why, how do you think we pray over your pictures? You come with your pictures. We lay hands on them. We don't look at pictures. We look at them as human beings there. 
We address human beings in the spirit. So address them as well. So when you are at that place where you don't know what to do, engage the power of prophecy. The only problem that we are having now, it is that the church has left prophecy in the hands of prophets. So we are the only ones that have been given the responsibility to prophesy. That is the problem. That is the problem. It is not only prophets that are supposed to prophesy. You are the one that is supposed to prophesy yourself first, even before I come and prophesy you. Listen, every one of us have been given the power by God to prophesy ourselves, to prophesy our lives. The only problem that we are having today, it is that the only time you want things to change, you look for a prophet, for a man. The man that carries the presence of God, the man that carries the, you know, the, 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 the grace of God to prophesy. And you go to him so that he can prophesy over your life. That is another level of the prophetic. And that is different from what I'm talking about right now. Very different from what I'm talking about here. Are you understanding? Where you are seated there, there is grace that God has given you. Where you can be able to drive things and change things in the spirit by the words of your mouth. By the decrees that are proceeding out of your tongue, you can be able to change things in your life. I'm not talking about prophesying. The problem is that because of this generation, every time a person hears of prophecy, they look at what we are doing, calling people's names, calling people's numbers and situations. That's what they think prophecy is. That is all. And that's the reason why even a lot of people today, even young men, are failing to prophesy today because when they think of prophecy, they just think of what I'm doing, what they have seen other men of God doing. Calling people's names and all. That's a problem. And that's the reason why we have got people now that are doing all kinds of funny things, missing prophecies, because they don't understand what prophecy is. Prophecy is not about the names and the numbers, no. That is the word of knowledge to make you know that God really knows what he's talking about. That's why, if you, you've observed very well, whenever you see me doing the prophecies of calling people names and all those, no, there's this one, there's this one, I only do that to people that I don't know, the people that I'm meeting for the first time. If I'm to prophesy any of my pastors here or any of my leaders, I don't even have to be mentioning names. These people already know that I'm a prophet, they believe in me. So I'll just come to them and just tell them, say, next week there's this that will happen, they'll believe. But if I meet a new person who doesn't even believe that I'm a prophet, there has to be something that I'll tell them to convince them. That's when we even go to the extent of telling them their birthdays, all these kind of things, so that they can be able to believe before we release the message. So what is prophecy there is not the birthday that I gave the person, but what I told them that is the mind of God. For example, I mentioned all these birthdays and all, but at the end of the day I say, God wants to give you a breakthrough in six weeks. That is a prophecy. All this was in prophecy. Are you understanding so even you, when we are telling you to prophesy, we are not talking to go to your husband, you get his false to say, there's a lady called Florence, I bind her. Mm -mm. No, nah, no, no, you don't, you don't have to do that. Now, uh, must you do that? That is not what prophecy... Prophecy is the power to declare the desired future. The ability, the power to declare the desired future. Declaring the desired future with power authoritatively, authorita authoritatively, that is what prophecy is. Where you can be able to predict the desired future by your verbal pronouncement. You can be able to foretell the future that you want to see by the power that is on your tongue. That is what prophecy is. I'm talking, that's the prophecy I'm talking about. Where you can be able to look at your life and analyze it very well. Realize that there is nothing good about your life any, at all. Every door is shut and closed. Doors are shut and closed. Then you, you, you analyze it. Then realize that this is not the life that I want. Then you come up with the life that you desire to see. Then you vocalize it. You verbalize it. You shape the future that you want to see with your words. That is what I call prophecy. Shaping your future with words. Dict 
demonstrating, declaring a desired future via verbal pronouncements. If you look at where your life is going, you can see that two years from now, things are going to go bad for you. But then you begin to change the future with words. It may appear like I'm about to get fired, but I prophesy I'll not be fired. I prophesy you, my job, you are intact, you are stable. No one will temper with you. That is what I'm talking about when I mean prophecy. When Ezekiel was told to prophesy by God, there was no name that he quoted. There was no name there that he quoted. He says, uh, born number three, you are for a man called George. And born number seven, you are by... He didn't do all those kind of display. He just said, bones, hear the word of the Lord. You shall live. So you, it's possible that you can look at your marriage and say, my marriage, hear the word of the Lord. You will be restored and you shall have peace. That is prophecy we are talking about. That is prophecy that we are talking about. Prophecy is consistency of the declaration of scriptures. You know, where you are consistently declaring the scriptures in order to fulfill your desired purpose. Consistent declaration of scriptures in order to fulfill your desired purpose. Where you are declaring the scriptures, what the Bible says about you, then you vocalize it in order to fulfill your desired purpose. That is what we mean by prophecy here. So when God says, son of man, prophesy, he was talking to him, say, tell these bones what you want them to be and they will be. That is the power that God has invested in you. Have you looked at that? Talk, talk to me. Have you understood what I'm talking about? That is what prophecy is. That is what prophecy is. Prayer, the way we pray is very good, but I've realized that a lot of people's prayers are not answered and you can testify. Because people don't even know how to pray. That's why the disciples in uh, Luke chapter 11, they went to him and said, Master, teach us how to pray. These are men of God. These are apostles. They didn't want to pray amiss according to, uh, to James chapter 3. They didn't want to pray amiss. They didn't want to pray amiss. So they said, teach us how to pray. Because a lot of us are praying amiss. Prayer is not complaining to God. No. A lot of our prayers are not answered because we don't know how to pray. These prayers of complaining, Father, look at me. Things are bad. God is not interested in those. Look at what the Bible says about you. Because my definition of prayer, listen to my definition of prayer. My definition of prayer is reasoning with God on the basis of the scriptures. reasoning with God on the basis of the scriptures, where you are talking to God on the ground of the scriptures. What the Bible says about you, you take it, put it in your spirit, then you bring it to God. Say, but why is this thing? If the Bible says this, why is my life like this? That is now prayer. Comparing your life with the promises that are wrapped up in the scriptures and petitioning God on that ground. That is what prayer is. So now, when you are in the place of prayer, apart from the complaints that you do, start prophesying your future. You remember when I told you about the, 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 the I am's that where you're declaring who you are. You begin to prophesy. Now, the I am, you are declaring it in the now by faith. But then prophesying, you are declaring your future. You are opening your future. You are planting words in the spirit. Planting words in the future. Planting words in the future. That is the Greek word prophetizo. It means to plant words in the spirit. To plant words in the future. When you say I will have a job. That word job is planted in the future. And to the future that's where you are going. So there is a point where you have planted a lot of words in the future. And as you are heading there you begin to bump into those words that we are planting. And they are happening to you. That is what prophecy does. How many of you. Give yourself time to be in the presence of God, what you call the place of prayer. And all you are doing is just to be planting words in your future. Shaping your future. Shaping your future. I'll be this, I'll have this, I'll have this, I'll have this. That is what we call prophecy. If you hear how I pray, I don't pray the way other people pray. No, I have got my own way of praying. 
There are times that I just give myself time. I'm just declaring things on my future, what I want to see, how my future will be. Next year, this will happen, I'll have this, I'll have this. I'm planning and plotting, bisecting the year before time. He said, prophesy to these dry bones. You can prophesy to that dry business of yours. You are seeing that you're doing business, there are no customers. How about prophesying to it? Prophesy it. Take it as if it has got ears and it hears. If bones manage to hear, your business can hear. Is it your business? You have customers. All your shoes, I'm speaking to you. Next week, you'll be all sold out. None of you will remain. In Jesus' name, I prophesy on you. This week that is coming, you all be sold out. That is prophecy. The problem is that you want to use logic and senses to do this thing. The moment you're trying to bring in your five senses, then you have gone to the flesh. Because Galatians chapter, is it Galatians chapter 2? It says, we are crucified. Ephesians, Galatians chapter 2, we are crucified with Christ, nevertheless we live. I am crucified with Christ. So this flesh you are seeing, it is all gone. You can see my flesh, but this is not the one that is living. It is my spirit. So can, does this thing make sense? As long as it makes sense, then it is not of the Spirit. It is not of the Spirit. That's why people that doubt the supernatural, they doubt because of one reason. They want to analyze the chemical composition of a miracle. They want to be told as if this is science. No, for you to get water, you need HO2, uh, H, you need the 2, you need an O, then you put them this and this and this and you have water. That's how they think miracles work. There's nothing that you're supposed to be, to, to, there's nothing that can be done. Didn't you realize that uh, Bartimaeus in, in Mark chapter 10, when he met Bartimaeus, Mark chapter 10, 46, he says, what do you want God to do for you that I may have eyes? What did he say? Go your way. For your what? Your faith has made you. And the Bible says that self same hour, his eyes opened. So for Bartimaeus, go your way. But in John chapter 9, when he met the guy, the Bible says he spat on the ground. He took the soil and put in his eyes, and the eyes opened. Go and wash at the spool of Ceylon. That was his healing. The other guy, he took him out of town from Chorazin and prayed for him from afar, and that's how he was healed. The other guy, the other woman with the issue of blood, it was just by touching the hem of the garment. So now, if you're going to be told to tell me how to heal the sick, how to heal the sick, it is just to spot, to spot on the ground, get, to spit on the ground, get mad and put in their eyes, then how are you going to explain the Batmeas one? Because there was no spit on Batmeas. So the chemical compound, there's no formula when it comes to miracles. They happen anyhow, anyway. So the problem is that you want to think if this thing is making sense. So, so if I go in my house and I begin to speak to my business, does it make sense? That's the reason why you are where you are because you want everything to make sense to you. Logic is what makes people doubt the supernatural. So today I'm charging you, as you go home, prophesy yourself. You will tell yourself what you want your life to be. This should be your normal daily prayer life where you are speaking over yourself. You are speaking over yourself. For me, I'm telling you, the way prophets are living, a lot of you, men of God, the way you live your lives, where you, you prophesy other people more than you prophesy yourself. For me, it's different. Me, I prophesy myself more. I prophesy myself more than I prophesy other people. I'm telling you. Glory be to God. So if I tell you how my next day is going to be, it is not necessarily that God has revealed it only, but I'm planning it by prophecy. I have already arranged it in the spirit. That is what prophecy is. Uh, because that now becomes witchcraft. If you're going to be prophesying others and you can't prophesy yourself as a man of God, because that, that's such witchcraft. Because that's witch doctors who like, they can heal the sick, but they can't heal themselves. Many things happen when people realize the power and the potency of scriptures. They, when they understand the power of prophecy. See what happened when he prophesied. Let me just show you something as I close. Verse 7, he says, So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. I'll give you just three things here. Number one, when he prophesied, there was what? A noise. Number two, he says, behold, a shaking. Number three, he says, and bones came together, bone to his bone. 
there are three things that happened after the man of God prophesied. There was a noise. <laughs> Anyone that desire, even this prophetic ministry that we do, if you desire the prophetic, prepare for noise. Every time you start prophesying, the first thing that happens is noise. Noise speaks of rumors. It speaks of controversy. It speaks of gossips by people. It speaks of controversy. Any person that walks in the genuine prophetic, controversy must follow him. There has to be noise around. The Bible says in the book of Mark chapter 2, it says when Jesus entered into the house, it says miracles were happening, he was teaching. It says and it was noise that brought that he was in the house. It was noise that brought that he was in the house. So as long as he's there, there has to be noise. In Acts chapter 2, it says, when he came, there was a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. There was noise everywhere as a sign that he has come. So that noise that follows, it is not a noise that God has left you, but as a, to show that indeed he is with you. Because when he leaves, he doesn't live with noise. He lives quietly. But when he comes, that's where noise comes. So the moment you start prophesying, prepare to see gossips and rumors around you. Just know that yes, the prophecy is working. Sometimes God works out in a way that we don't even understand. It works out in a way that doesn't even suit our expectations. The first thing is noise. Rumors are going to be spread about you. Gossips are going to be spread about you. People are going to be talking about you. They will talk about you. Just know that that's one of the process of the prophetic. It's working. Don't be discouraged when people start talking about you. Don't be discouraged when people begin to gossip you. When people that are your friends begin to backbite you. It is the prophecy on your life that is coming to pass. Joseph, when his prophecy was about to come to pass, the Bible says he was afar. When they saw him, they said, there cometh a dreamer. They started talking about him. So whenever you're about to fulfill destiny, people must talk about you first. They must talk about you. Someone somewhere has to talk about you. And the second thing we said, and behold, a shaking. That is the second thing that happened. There has to be a shaking. There has to be a shaking. Things have to shake in your life before it brings them together. Have you ever seen a situation whereby you are praying instead of things waking out it as, if, as if they are not waking out? As if they are going bad. That is a shaking. Before you started praying, your business was doing well. When you started praying, even that little business started shaking. That is a sign that you are about to fulfill your prophecy. It says, behold, the shaking. There has to be a shaking first. Men of God, sometimes ministry has to shake. Just know that you're about to fulfill your prophecy. Sometimes your business shakes. Things shake. Your marriage shake. Even when you're prophesying, things have to go bad somewhere. That is a sign that things are waking out. Have you realized that in the book of Acts chapter 16 verse 25, it, say, it says, when Paul and Silas prayed at midnight, it says something happened. He said, and suddenly there was a shaking. So as a sign that you're about to come out of the prison, there has to be a shaking somewhere. Your relationship has to shake somewhere. Your business has to shake somewhere. Your job has to shake. Your source of income has to shake somewhere. That is when God reshapes your life. Sometimes God doesn't make you until he breaks you. He has to break you first and he begins to make you. The Bible says Jeremiah entered into the house of one of the porter. And when he entered there, he saw a porter was making a vessel. But when he looked at it first, it was made. Then he had to break it before he could make it. And after it was broken, that's how he started making it again. At times, God breaks you in order to make you. If Jacob was never broken on his hip, Israel wouldn't have been born. For Israel to be born, Jacob Jacob's hip had to be broken. Imagine you are coming from the presence of the Lord and you are limping. So what is happening? He said, it's God that has broken my bone. Uh, who is this God that breaks bones? People who don't understand. So at times, God breaks you in order to make you. He is wrestling with God. He is fighting with God. And the Bible says an angel that represented God hits him on the, on the hip. And he had this dislocation. The bone was broken. And God says, now since the bone has been broken, that's when I've changed your name. You're no longer Jacob, you're Israel. 
So Israel is never born until there's a shaking. Until there's a breaking somewhere. You have to be broken somewhere. Because when you're broken, you totally depend on God. There are times that you are left with no option that to look up to him. The other time I told you that that's the reason why God will make you fall. Because whenever your back goes on the ground, your eyes will look up to God. So that shaking that you're talking about, that shaking that you're complaining about, it might just be a strategy that God is using to actually make your life better. Do you know that if trees begin to shed leaves, it doesn't mean they are dying. It means they are preparing to flourish. So we are going into August very soon. You will see that all these beautiful trees, they begin to shed leaves. When they are shedding leaves, it, is not, it doesn't mean that they are dying. They are actually preparing to bring forth new leaves that are going to bring a harvest, that are going to produce fruits. So that's why you started losing those connections. You are not dying. No, it's just God preparing you so that something new can be born out of you. And the last one that happened as I close now. It says, and bones came together, born to his bone. <laughs> Look at the prophetic here. Bones came together, born to his bone. Prophecy had to locate bones and join them together, born to his bone. Do you know what that means? That means a collar bone didn't go to the ankle. A bone that was supposed to come to the finger didn't go to the shoulder. They came together. They were scattered abroad. So this hand was that side, the leg was that side. But when they were coming together, they had to look. The shoulder went straight on the shoulder. The vertebral column went straight there. The backbone on his, on his bone. The, what do you call them? The tibia, the fibula. All of them went together. The ankle, everything. The knee bones, they went direct. The knee bone didn't go to the leg. It came direct on the knee. The other guy's bone, that short guy's bone, didn't go to a tall guy's bone. They received their rightful bone, bone to his bone. Each man's bones went exactly at their place. That speaks of divine connections. The final stage of prophecy is what we call divine connections. When God is giving you connections, he doesn't just give you any person anyhow, no. He gives you people that rightly, that rightly fit into your life. That's what the Bible says, a word fitly spoken. It is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. So when God is giving you connections, he gives you someone who will fit in your life. Who will do something for your life. If These are not helpers. Those are not helpers. I'm telling you, those are not destiny helpers. You don't know destiny helpers. Those that are not helpers, helpers when they come in your life, you don't ask for it. They release it themselves. Destiny helpers. Destiny helpers every day. Every day to my phone saying, destiny helper like that. Those are not destiny helpers. So we have met people that you just meet him and you sometimes you think like this person has got a problem or something. Every time you meet them, they dash you something. Those are destiny helpers. You don't ask for help. They just release help without you asking it. People that fitly meet your help. People that meet you at your need. Yeah, they are, they, are, they, are paid. they are levels of destiny helpers. They are those helpers that will say, no, I'll meet you halfway. Let's help one another. Those are helpers who okay, get on another level. But they are those that meet all your needs. These are destiny helpers. So, in spirit, you are going to say, I'm going to say, Praise be to God. I know, I can't help you. They are not your helpers. It is you sourcing out a connection out of them. A person who is genuinely a helper. You don't have to push and push. No. It's mutual. They help you mutually. He says bones joined, bone to his bone. They know where there is a need and they meet it. They know where there is need of help and they meet it. Praise be to God. These are destiny helpers. These are right connections. Connections that 
will change your life. You don't push for them. When they happen, they happen. When they come your way, you will feel it. Imagine you are looking at your life, it is moving like that and you are not doing anything. Sometimes you have done everything. Start prophesying to your life. That's the last thing that God does. That is the last thing that God advises a person that is stranded to do. Prophesy yourself. There is nothing that is as powerful as prophecy. Prophecy. Do you know that right now, the church is, the church is busy doubting and persecuting prophecy and prophets. Do you know that even people that are wicked, they trust prophecy? Haven't you watched movies like American movies, maybe even, even movies like The Matrix, you watched about the Legend of the Seeker, you, you, even the Black Panther, all these. They'll tell you that only one storyline. So there was a prophecy that was released and we're supposed to, even the Harry Potter, all these kind of movies that you see, they're only talking about one thing. There'll be someone who is supposed to fulfill a prophecy somewhere. No, there was a case that was released. You've seen these, uh, what, what? the pirates. Those guys are following prophecy and the case. Those people, to tell you that they believe in this thing, it is only you that don't understand prophecy. It is only you. Those people, they believe somebody when they prophesy, even though these things like the apocalypto, you see that these were prophecies that were happening. Somebody prophesies that the person will be chasing a jaguar, you'll be moving like this, you'll be chasing a jaguar and it will happen like this. And everyone was living there waiting to the extent that when the guy was about to be killed, he refused that he can't die because he has a prophecy on his head. These are not Christian movies. I mean, some of you might have watched that old movie, Apocalypto. When they Sterling, the guy was supposed to die, the main actor, he refused that he can't die because he has a prophecy on his head that he's supposed to fulfill. That is the reason why a man like me can't take my life. You are too small. I have a prophecy that I'm supposed to fulfill. The fear that some of you have, despite the good prophecies that we hang on your head. We told you you are going to be great, you are going to be this, but any little thing that threatens me, you fear that you are going to die. Just a little thing, you have forgotten about your prophecy. I always tell you that no matter who can fight me, I'm not going anywhere because there is a prophecy on my head. It has not been fulfilled even halfway. Until I see it come to pass, then I can tell you that, okay, now at least maybe a rapture can rapture me up. But as long as that way does not come to pass, I'm going nowhere. I am here. It is only you that don't trust prophecy. People that are in the secular world, they believe this thing. Okay, you don't trust any other prophecy. Everyone is not fake. Prophesy yourself now. Start declaring what you want to say. I've told you what to do. It is not about me only, but you as well. You have got the power to speak over your life. And what you say will come to pass. Everyone else believes in prophecy apart from you. Muslims, Hindus, they trust prophecy, those people. They believe. The way Muslims will kill for their prophet, you would know that they trust prophecy. Those guys believe in prophecy. Start prophesying yourself. Stand up on your feet. Stand. More Than Conquerors Family, demonstrating God's power and revealing Jesus.